Let's get started. So um, thank you guys very much for joining us. Uh, Shawnee and I are actually in the same office. We're the only two people in the office. Um, we spent the afternoon trying to get a camera set up and microphone set up that was socially distanced, but that did not work out. So, uh, so she's off in a different room. But anyway, thank you guys for joining. I'll introduce Shawnee in a second, but my name is Mark LaMonica. I look after the individual investor team for Morningstar here in Australia. And today we are going to talk about constructing a portfolio to help you achieve your goals. So before I go into that, I need to go through the housekeeping items, and then I'll introduce you, Shawnee. So number one, anything you hear from either of us today is general advice. We don't know anything about you, so we cannot offer personal advice. If you are in New Zealand, you can get our FAP on our website, morningstar.com.au. And the regulatory authorities encourage you to seek out a financial advisor if you're looking for personal advice. All right. The other thing is we would love questions. Um, so the questions can be like David asked um, about what we're drinking. We have Andrew saying cocktail assisted investing. Um, yeah, that's what we're looking for. So we are going to try to do two of these um, in the evening, uh, at least Sydney time. So one this week, one next week to supplement our regular Tuesday, Thursday webinars, just to see if that is a time that we can, that more people can join. Um, so anyway, let me know how you're doing. If you are having a drink with us, take a picture, send it into my email address, mark.lamonica1 at morningstar.com, and maybe I'll put up some pictures for next week. But anyway, as I said, I'm going to introduce you, Shawnee. So um, yeah, Shawnee is an investment specialist on our team here for the individual investor team at Morningstar in Sydney. Um, she's also the co-host of Investing Compass, our podcast. So I don't know, anything you want to add about yourself that I yeah, left I mean, out, when, Shawnee? <laughs> I used to do these quite a lot. Um, so when we first started doing them in March, Last year, I was on maybe every second one or every third one um, when I'd come along. And the joke was always that I would have um, three or four glasses of water next to me, but I've just got a beer today. So, Exactly. Well, that's, that's good. <laughs> is that that's enough? Good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good introduction. You drinking is a great introduction. Okay. <laughs> let's, uh, let's get started. I will try to go back to the PowerPoint. Once again, that's our Instagram account. All right, constructing a portfolio. So my email address is in the invite. So if anyone has any questions that you don't want to answer or you don't want to ask right now, you can send through anything to my email address. I will get back to you. But uh, yeah, Shawnee, you want to kick us off with the agenda today? Yeah, for sure. So um, this presentation that we're going to go through today, um, it's based on goals-based portfolio construction. And that's basically a fancy way of saying that we're going to focus on constructing your portfolio around the investor instead of the investment, which is something that we say a lot at Morningstar. So um, we have a detailed guide on constructing your portfolio on Morningstar Premium, which is our subscription service. Um, but you can also take out a four-week free trial to, um, to access that guide, or you can just listen to our podcast, Investing Compass, which is free and it's on every single platform that you could find um, and podcasts on. So basically what it does is it runs through the process as well um, in our portfolio construction episode. So go and listen to that. And the goals-based portfolio process involves a four-step framework to build a portfolio that's aligned to your goals. Um, so we're going to run through those this evening, and then we're going to speak a little bit about what happens after you finish this process. So you've got your portfolio, it's all constructed. Um, what do you do from there? And yeah, so the work's basically just not done. Um, you've got to maintain your portfolio and make sure you're on track to reach your goals over the long term. All right. So as Shani said, we are going to go through four different steps tonight. So Simply, how much will your goal cost? And one of the really important things about goals and goals-based investing, and this is very difficult for people because um, people do not like to go into this much detail about the future, is you need to actually go through and define this goal, um, which is what this four-step process is. And you know, one caveat that I always do like to include is there is no reason your goal can't change. But going through this exercise is valuable. It does provide, hopefully we'll tell you today why it's uh, uh, why it's valuable, but it does provide a framework that can help guide your investing. But that does not need it. That does not mean it cannot change. So if you are on the younger side of things and trying to plan for your retire retirement that could be 30 years in the future, um, don't worry. You can always change that as your 
life changes, your expectations change. The other thing, and we can talk about this a little bit at the end, is sometimes it's good to go through this process in stages of your life. So whether you are looking at, not to sound like Stalin, but a five-year plan um, or, uh, or a 10-year plan and sort of plan your life around smaller milestones. And yes, this also does work if you are in retirement. Once again, you can look at different phases of your retirement. So typically what people do is obviously go through the transition um, to retirement phase, they then will potentially wind down on their retirement at a certain point. So there would be a period where you'd be more active, you would travel more, um, and then a period where perhaps you would spend less money because your circumstances change. But anyway, what are these four steps that we're going to go through? How much will your goal cost? And remember, inflation is very important, especially if you are planning this way out into the future. When do you want to achieve your goal? Pretty easy. How much have you saved currently for your goal? So depending upon how uh, on top of your finances you are, you may have to spend some time pulling some statements, doing things like that. And then, of course, how much can you save in the future for your goal? And all of this, as Shani is about to take us through, all of this are inputs into a formula that will allow you to calculate your, retire your required rate of return, which is important. So, Shani, let's, uh, let's go through an example Sure. Um, so let's get through an example. So I'm going to talk about retirement as a goal. So I'm 45 in this example, and I want to retire when I'm 65. So that's a 20 year time horizon. And we're trying to find out what my goal is going to cost, as Mark explained in that first step. So when people retire, their expenses decrease. The general rule is that it's about 70% of the expenses that they currently have. So I would say that um, I won't be commuting as much. I won't be putting as much money away for saving or investing. Um, I wouldn't be <laughs> going down to the the dumpling bar downstairs every second night, or maybe I would. Um, maybe that's what my retirement be would be. But uh, my salary, say it's 100K a year, I'm after 70K because that's 70%. So in 20 years time with a 2.2% inflation rate, um, that would be about $107,000. And I would want to use a 4% withdrawal rate just to keep this simple. So I would need $2.7 million. Um, so we have what, how much my goal will cost taking into account inflation. So that's 2.7 million. Um, and two, when I want to achieve the goal, which is in 20 years. Okay, and just uh, and just maybe a couple a couple things on here um, that uh, that are important. So you know the four percent rule is one of these classic rules in investing, um, which is supposed to be a safe withdrawal rate. Now there is a lot of controversy around that right now. Um, so it was a rule that was. Uh, that a financial advisor in the U.S. came up with in the mid '90s, but we're just using this um, for simplicity's sake. So there are different uh, there are different inputs in here that you should consider. But uh, but just wanted to uh, just wanted to explain that. And obviously, the seventy percent, Shawnee's example of not going down to the dumpling bar. I will say that I'm guilty <laughs> of going there with her a lot. Um, it all depends me. on. Sorry. You do enable me. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> My dumpling uh, addiction. Yeah, it, it, it's not dumplings that she goes there for. It's the cheapest <laughs> drinks in Sydney. But um, but obviously, use your own personal circumstances. So some people can spend less in retirement. Some people can spend a lot more. So, you know, in Shawnee's example of going to the dumpling bar after work, maybe when she's retired, she'll go down there at 11 a.m. Um, so just obviously come up with your own uh, with your own personal circumstances here. This is just an example. All right, Shawnee, take it away. All right, so we're going to um, address the other two parts of the question that Mark's the other two questions that Mark spoke about. So the first is how much have you saved for your goal? So I'm going to say that I've saved $450,000 by the time I'm 45. And how much can you save in the future for your goal? So I'm going to say $7,000 a year post tax. So if we left it at that and just let my money um, sit in cash earning nothing, I would have $911,000. And that's a third of what I'd need to achieve my goal. And um, so I need to invest to be able to achieve that goal because what I'm looking to have, $70,000 each and every year in retirement is pretty unrealistic if I'm just relying on the saving that I'm doing at the moment. So this is going to push me into taking on some growth assets in my portfolio. So I already know that from looking at this, I can't really survive on $911,000 if I want $70,000 each and every year in my retirement. Um, so, But I'm jumping ahead. So we've just completed the first step of portfolio construction. So we do have a goal. So I need $2.7 million in 20 years. I already have $450,000 and I'm committing to investing $7,000 post tax um, towards my goal until I reach my goal. So what's next, Mark, if you wanted to chat about that? 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So what we are doing here um, is we are, and you can see it down uh, down here, what we're doing is basically we're defining every one of the inputs into the time value of money formula. So the time value money formula is one of the most important concepts in investing. And anyone who has tuned into our uh, how to value a share uh, webinars, has probably heard this before, but what we're what we're trying to do here is we're basically looking at the concept that a dollar today is worth more than a dollar in the future. So when we are valuing shares, we're discounting those future cash flows back to the present day. But what we can do is we can also adjust this formula, which allows you to calculate your required rate of return. So given all of these different inputs that Shani was talking about, what is the return that gets her from where she is with what she's saving to where she wants to be. So that is what we're doing here. Now, we put the formula down there, but we, of course, as Shani likes to explain to me, like I am old enough to have started math using an abacus or something. What she likes to explain to me is we are in the age of calculators. So you do not have to calculate this yourself. But what you do need to know is realize how those different inputs will um, factor into what your future value what the future value of your account will be worth. So hopefully this should be obvious, but you can go in with this calculator, you can go in with our portfolio projection um, calculator and play around with these different inputs and see what the impact is. So obviously the more that you save, the higher the future value is. The more time you have until your goal, the more the future value is the more you have right now, the more the future value is. So think about all of those different inputs. And one of the reasons why we really encourage people to go through and do this goal setting process is because it can, number one, tell you if your goal is actually realistic. And the required rate of return is the figure that is going to tell you if it's realistic to meet your goal or not. So if you were getting a required rate of return that is in double digits um, or even probably not more than double digits, but if it's in double digits, if you're coming up with 35%, your goal is not achievable. So unless you are um, the best investor of all time, you're not getting 35% over a long time period. So what that allows you to do is take a step back and think, okay, what are the different things I can change? I could bring my goal back. Maybe I don't need as much money. So in Chinese example, maybe I need $50,000 a year um, instead of 70,000. It could um, factor into when you retire, if retirement is your goal. So maybe not retiring at 65, maybe delaying that retirement because time will help you or it means you could save more money. So all of these are really important steps. And what we have here is we do have a screenshot and I will, uh, and I will go to our website in a second. We do have a screenshot of the calculator that we have on Morningstar Premium. There are also calculators available just on the internet. So don't feel like you need to use premium, of course, we would encourage you to um, take a trial and use it. But you can also go on and look at any future value calculator that does allow you to calculate for that interest rate, is how they sometimes put it, or required rate of return. So let me quickly stop sharing this, and I will go to our website and just show you where it is. And we can, uh, and we can go through and put in those same inputs. Of course, for people that are have been on here before, I always struggle to find uh, to find anything because I have too many windows open, as lots of people give me grief for, especially you, Shani. But I bet you I can find it. Um, one second. This is where it'd probably be helpful if I had this all set up and closed all my other windows. <laughs> what do you think, Shani? I think that's a good idea. I thought you would have learned by now, haven't you? Done 100, 150 of these. I have done a lot of these, unfortunately. <laughs> um, mostly, unfortunately, for the people that actually uh, that actually go on to them. Wow, I have a lot of windows open. This is where you're supposed to make the advantage of having you on here. You're supposed to do some filler, Shani. Mm, I'd rather watch you struggle, to be honest, mate. But you don't have a <laughs> uh, you don't have a routine you want to go through. No, no, nothing really. 
All right. Well, for some reason, I cannot find that window, but I will get to it. But trust me, this is on our this is on our website, so it is under Track Investments Goal Setting. All right. So basically, what we're doing is we're going through and putting all of Shawnee's goals into uh, into a calculator. So you can do this obviously in a third party calculator before. So she said she has four hundred fifty thousand dollars saved. She wants a future value of one point seven four million. Um, now we have included inflation in this, um, so there are two different ways you could use inflation. So originally, Shawnee talked about using the inflation for that $70,000 a year that she wanted, um, and then using 4% gets you to $2.7 million. So she should put in 2.2% a year's inflation. So inflation is very important. Um, then she's saving $7,000 a year annually. You can, of course, put in monthly or quarterly as well. And her time horizon is 20 years. So she is going to come up with a 8.6% required rate of return. Now, this is very important for a number of reasons. So I talked about why it was important to, number one, make sure that your goal is realistic. But the other reason that this is important, or the two other reasons this is important, because this is going to be an input into your asset allocation. So I'll spend a second talking about asset allocation. At a high level, what asset allocation is, is simply a mix between growth assets and defensive assets. So an example of a growth asset is shares. Um, example of a defensive asset is fixed interest or cash. And really the difference between the two is growth assets have a higher expected future return where defensive assets have a lower expected future return. And what you're getting out of this is you are getting less risk as risk is defined by the financial services industry. And risk, of course, is defined in terms of volatility. So how much is the value of your portfolio going to bounce around? So by taking on that risk as an investor, by taking on more volatility, you are getting higher expected returns. So if you invest 100% in shares, you would expect your portfolio to bounce around in value more, but you would get a higher expected return. If you invest in defensive assets, we'll use cash as an extreme example. Cash, there will be no volatility. Um, you will not, um, you, your cash balance will not bounce around and lose value, but you'll get a very low expected um, uh, rate of return. So those are the choices you're making as investors. Now, obviously, asset allocation gets a little more complex, as we'll talk about, because there are many different asset classes. But at a very high level, what you're exchanging is you're exchanging risk as defined by volatility for return. So that minimum required rate of return is the input into that asset allocation. And we at Morningstar <laughs> believe it's very important that you do it this way, because Traditionally, a lot of the financial services industry will instead rely on something like a risk tolerance questionnaire. And you can see this when you go on to a lot of different, um, a lot of different robo advice platforms. They'll ask you to respond to how you or to predict how you would respond to volatility, to prices bouncing around. Now, that doesn't account for your goal. So we believe that. Just looking at risk tolerance, just looking at how you'll respond to fluctuations in your portfolio is not a good way to go about investing because you're investing to achieve a goal. And that's why this required rate of return is really important. So let's talk a little bit about asset allocation. So the higher that this required rate of return is, the more growth assets you need to put in your portfolio. Now, obviously, there is no perfect formula for this, um, but just remember that if you are trying to get, in this case, an 8.6% required rate of return over the long term, you are going to have to invest in mostly growth assets, and you're going to have to tolerate that volatility in order to achieve your goal. And asset allocation is really important. So, um, you know, there have been various studies that have gone out there, but up to 90% of the variability in your return can be explained by asset allocation. So the simple example, once again, is to sit there and say, if I invest in an all share portfolio, I should get a higher rate of return than I, if I invest in an all cash portfolio. Um, so it is important to set up an asset allocation that can help you achieve that goal. Um, so we do have five different portfolios on our website. Um, which we're showing here. So in this case, the aggressive asset allocation would make sense. So there are a number of different asset class 
classes on here, but 90% of this is in growth assets. So in terms of uh, in terms of defensive assets, we've got Aussie fixed interest, international fixed interest in cash, uh, making up that 10%, but the rest of that is in equities, is in listed property, is in infrastructure, which are growth assets. Um, so that's, uh, that's how you inform your asset allocation. Um, and we will go on to the next step, which of course is selecting investments um, but actually, first, Shani, why don't you uh, why don't you explain? Um, I guess one thing that people that go in there, this is this is explained in terms of CPI plus returns. So maybe that's something that you could uh, you could help explain. Yeah. Um, so all of our asset allocation targets there. Um, sorry, the targets that we have for performance are CPI plus. Um, so what that really means is the real return objective, and real return objectives focus on how much you're getting above inflation. Um, so all of them there. So it says CPI plus one. So it's matching inflation and then one percent return above that. Then there's CPI plus two, plus three, and so on. Um, so for our portfolio, which needs eight point six, I need a pretty aggressive asset allocation. So I'm going to go for the most aggressive one. So that one is CPI plus four for the uh, models that we have. All right. Big swig there, mate. Sorry? Yeah, big swig. Well, I mean, you know, I didn't know you were going to stop right there. So yeah. I was uh, <laughs> just working through that. Okay. So the next step, and then obviously we can we can answer questions and go through, uh, go through the stuff in more detail. The next step is finally selecting investments. And I do want to go back to something that Shani said at the beginning of, uh, of this. You know, we do have this saying at Morningstar that we're about the investor and not the investment. And notice how this is the last step. What do most people do? They jump to this step immediately um, because I guess that's the fun part about investing, um, that you get to go out and pick different investments. You hear about something from your mate at the barbecue um, and you just want to jump right into it. But uh, but yeah. That's uh, that's what we want to do, and we want to go through um, we want to go through this decision tree around looking at shares or different managed products, um, different strategies, and different investments, and find out what's right for you and your goals. And we do want to go through this in every single asset class. Um, that's uh, that is pretty important. So uh, so Shani, you want to uh, Shani actually wrote a guide. Um, so I think this is your best guide. I don't know. I don't know what you think, but Johnny wrote this guide called, uh, yeah, the Morningstar Guide to Selecting Investments. Really creative um, so, title, you know. Yeah, I know. Very yeah. original title. <laughs> tells you tells you what it is. It's uh, it's good. So why don't you go through this process since you uh, since you wrote the guide. Oh, yeah, so the guide really goes through selecting um, investments step by step. So it'll walk you through how to do this for each of your asset classes that you're trying to fill. Um, so did you want to go through an example together? Mark after this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so um, some of the considerations when you're picking investments are whether you're going to go for direct equities or a managed investment. So a managed investment could be a managed fund, an ETF or a LIC, which is a listed investment company. Um, and then if it is a managed investment, whether you want to take that active or passive approach. So active is when you have someone actively picking the assets within the investment. Um, and passive is when it follows a market index like the ASX 200. So that would be investing in the top 200 big companies companies of the um, ASX by market cap. And the large, last major consideration is whether you're going to focus on exchange or non-exchange traded products. So an exchange traded product um, would be an ETF or a LIC um, and listed like a direct equity um, or something you can invest in on through the ASX basically. And then an unlisted product could be a managed fund. So okay. Do you want to so we do an yeah, Aussie equity yeah. Let's do an example. example. Let's do an example. How about I'll uh, I'll quiz you on this since you uh, since you did write the guide. Does All that right. sound fair? Yeah. Sure. All right. So why don't we why don't we pick Aussie equities? So of course you do want to do this for every asset class, and as Shani will go through this example, you'll find out why. Um, all right. So let's uh, let's use Aussie equities. So the first decision we need to make: Are we going to use direct equities? Are we going to use managed investments? And one thing that is important um, to note during this whole thing is you do not have to pick one. You can obviously create a portfolio that does have a mixture. But Shani, let's talk about you. What would you uh, What would you pick? How would you go through this process? Yeah, so my Aussie equity allocation is 30%. So if we go back to those models, um, they tell me to put 30% in domestic equities. Um, the first thing I'll look at is how much of my initial investment is 
of that is four of four hundred and fifty thousand dollars is thirty percent, um, and that's one hundred and thirty five thousand. So that qualifies me for both direct shares and collective investments. Um, so it's important to consider brokerage though for listed investments. So direct shares, ETFs, and LICs. Um, so to buy any of these investments, you do need to incur brokerage, and brokerage varies from provider to provider. But generally, for Aussie equities, you're looking between five and twenty dollars, and we need to consider whether the brokerage cost is too much for the investment. So for example, if I was investing $100 instead of um, that parcel of 135,000, the brokerage wouldn't really make sense. Um, you're spending between five to 20% of your investment before the market even starts moving. So for managed funds, they've obviously got fees attached to them. So we've got to be mindful of the fees. They're a huge influence on your total return um, and your final outcome as well. Okay, so that's one side of things, right? So you're allocating part of that 450 grand, but you also said you were saving 7% or $7,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you know, we put in the calculator, we put in annually um, that you were saving that, but, you know, sort of realistically, what kind of approach would you take? Um, would you save every paycheck? Would you let it build up for a year? Um, that's, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a big. Uh, that's a big contributor. That's a big contributor to how you're actually going to uh, to pick these investments. So typically, right, if you're saving for super or saving in super for your retirement, you are going to save paycheck and pay, paycheck to paycheck. Um, and there obviously are a lot of tax benefits for uh, for that. Um, so yeah, I mean, looking at that, um, I think uh, I think unlisted investments. There is something so managed funds. There is something to be said about investing in that. Now, Shani loves funds. Um, so you know what? Uh, yeah. What is what is the benefit of that? Right. You don't incur brokerage um, yeah, generally like if you set up a saving plan. I don't like right, doing sorry, the dirty I... work. So like you just kind of let someone else do it for you. So, <laughs> um, but it is, it is a question we get a lot. Um, I, so do I save up and invest in a lump sum or do I dollar cost average? So dollar cost averaging is investing in small increments over a period of time. Um, and that's basically what you're doing without knowing it when you're investing paycheck to paycheck. So we're not the only ones um, that have studied this, but um, people have studied this and looked at the results of both approaches over a period of time and ultimately time in the market wins out. So investing sooner gives your money a longer time horizon to grow. So if you're accumulating your funds over the year, best that it's invested instead of sitting in cash and doing this over a long period of time um, also allows it to compound. And of course, that means you can spread your um, risk over multiple asset prices. So you're not just locked into that first price that you invested at and um, you're over quite a few transactions um, for the case of $135,000 and then $7,000 over the year, paycheck to paycheck. Okay, so we are we are getting some comments that we need to slow down, Shani. Sorry. So, <laughs> no, 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 don't apologize, don't apologize. But yeah, we'll go back through, we'll go back through another example of this um, if, that, uh, if that is helpful. Um, but yeah, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about um, about what your other choices are. Um, so why don't we uh, why don't we talk about some of the different considerations that you would make um, between going active versus passive? Does that sound like a, a good plan, Shani? Yeah, it does. Um, okay. So go for go it, ahead. mate. <laughs> no, no, you're up. No, you go for it, mate. You start. Why don't you start with active? And then I'll go. Okay, with <laughs> I will. Uh, I will start. To, I will start with active. So once again, maybe just a quick definition to uh, to begin this. Um, but uh, but active investing is following a uh, is following a manager that is either um, selecting uh, investments themselves or potentially there are computers, of course, doing this. That is more factor investing. But either way, somebody is making an active decision about what to put into that investment vehicle. Now that can be an ETF or that can be a fund, um, but either way, somebody's making those decisions. And there are different asset classes that active investing works better in. Now, passive, of course, is following an index. So there are all sorts of different indexes, but let's just assume we are looking at a wide, large index, something like the ASX 200, the S&P 500, and not some of these thematic indexes that have come up. But that simply means that the fund or the ETF, which can also both be, they can both be active or passive. So it's a little bit of a misnomer that all ETFs are, are passive. Um, but 
either one, you can uh, you can get exposure to either passive following index or active with with a manager. Um, so let's talk about different considerations to uh, to go into that because as I said, for each asset class, you could make different decisions. So we have a report here at Morningstar, Shani, called the Active Passive Barometer. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So we've mentioned this a lot, especially in our podcast, but um, it is a US focused um, report, but it still has some pretty revealing insights and we um, publish it biannually, so twice a year. Um, and in the latest report, which came out in March, I think the results revealed that in general, actively managed funds have failed to beat their benchmarks, especially over longer time horizons. So only 24% of all active funds topped the average of their passive rivals over the 10 year period ending, ending June 2020. So when we're looking at um, where the success lies, it was high among international funds and um, real estate funds, bond funds and the low success rates where with large cap funds. So places that are um, extremely well researched and watched. So what this really means is that if you're looking for exposure to large cap stocks in well researched markets like the Aussie market, um, you're probably better off going for a passive fund because although it's not impossible, it's really hard for active managers to find opportunities in these markets and opportunities that can justify and make up for their higher fees um, in performance are few and far between. So it's really hard to... Um, meet that 1% hurdle rate that a lot of um, active managers have. You know, some are cheaper, some are more expensive, but it means that you do need to beat the market by at least 1%. And it's really hard to find that when the market is well-researched um, and there are a lot of punters in it. So um, generally less efficient markets are the markets that investors are not interested in and there are structural issues preventing investors from accessing them. So small caps are a really good example where you might seek an active fund um, or markets that aren't as well covered like emerging markets. So um, if you'd like a little bit more information on active versus passive, we do go through this um, in detail in our episode. I think it's our first funds and ETFs episode, Mark. I think that was... Yeah, absolutely. And obviously, you know, as I said at the beginning, anyone can uh, can email me, uh, mark.lamonica1 at morningstar.com, and I can pass along any, any information that you have or any information that you would like, not that you have. Okay, <laughs> so let's, uh, let's go through quickly this last part. We are getting a lot of questions. I do want to spend some time um, with, uh, with questions, Shani. So I'll quickly go through exchange versus non-exchange traded, and then we can move on to another reason why taking a goals-based approach works, and then we'll start getting into questions, if that's, uh, if that's fair for everyone. And we are getting a lot of questions about um, dollar cost averaging versus, uh, versus lump sum investing, so we can talk about that. But quickly, let's look at exchange traded versus non-exchange traded. So as I said, for both active and passive investments, um, funds and ETFs are uh, are both available for you. And I made some jokes about Shani being the queen of funds earlier. Um, but uh, but I think funds, you know, from my perspective, I think funds are probably underrated. Um, I think ETFs have done a great job marketing. A lot of people feel like ETFs are uh, are where they should invest. But let's talk about some of the different considerations. So an ETF, particularly if we're talking about dollar cost averaging versus lump sum investing, as Shani said earlier, an ETF does incur brokerage. Um, so it is important to remember that, that if you are saving paycheck paycheck and trying to invest in ETFs, you are going to pay a fair amount of brokerage. This obviously is very dependent upon how much, um, number one, who your provider is. There is cheap brokerage out there, but also how much you're actually investing. Um, so you should think about that transaction cost and how that's going to impact you. The advantage of funds is, and I think, you know, Shani, this is the approach you have taken with your own investing, is you can set up savings plans um, where you do not incur any brokerage. So you can invest paycheck to paycheck, um, which essentially is dollar cost averaging, which we'll get into in a second, um, versus uh, lump sum, where if you are investing all uh, a large lump sum at one time, brokerage probably matters less, obviously dependent upon, uh, dependent upon how much that lump sum is. So Shani, I don't know if you want to spend two minutes just talking about kind of your approach with, uh, with funds, and maybe that mm -hmm. would be helpful for people. Yeah, sure. So um, I started investing on a graduate salary, so I didn't have much to invest. Um, and so I found when I was looking at direct equities, it was really hard for me to invest in these small parcels without um, losing a 
fair chunk of my money for brokerage. So I started um, saving up and I think I invested $1,000 in Magellan. I think that was my first <laughs> my first investment and um, I kept investing from there. So I invested every single paycheck, um, whatever I had in terms of whatever I had left over at the end of the month, I would invest as well. And um, that was a really, really easy way for me to just keep my money invested in the market um, as soon as I got it. And I've continued to do that today. So I've obviously... Um, progressed in terms of my portfolio since then and I've um I've implemented a goals-based approach and I have different types of assets and different managed funds. I also hold direct equities. I hold ETFs. Um, but with my managed funds, I still maintain the same. So I just invest the same amount every single um, paycheck. All right. Cool. So before we, before we get into questions, let me go through one more reason why, uh, why taking a goals-based approach does make sense in our in our mind here, um, is it does allow you to actually track progress against your portfolio. So remember, we did talk about that required rate of return. Um, so that's the return that's going to get you from where you are to where you need to be um, and how that works. So what that allows you to do is compare your actual returns to that required rate of return, recalculate that required rate of return which can give you an update on basically progress that you're making towards, uh, towards your goal. So let's use an example here. Um, so we use the original example that Shani walked through. So let's pretend it is now 10 years later. So remember, we originally had that 20-year time frame until retirement. So 10 years have gone by. Now, simplistically, what we've assumed here is that all of this entire $450,000 was invested into the Vanguard Australian shares, so VAS ETF, which is very popular. So we went back, um, and we did this a little while ago, um, March 30th, 2021. We went back a 10-year period before that, and we looked at the return that you would receive if you had invested in that Vanguard Australian shares ETF. So you would have gotten a 7.72% return, which is pretty good. But once again, that is below that 8.6% return, 8 return that you needed to achieve your goals. So you are falling behind. And you know that because you have gone through this goals-based investing approach. Now, one of the problems without doing this is you really have no idea if you're on track to retirement. So you have, in 10 years, you've gone from a $450,000 portfolio to a little over a million dollar portfolio. Now, that sounds great. I think many people would sit there and say that's very successful. Um, but in fact, given where you want to get, you are falling behind those returns. So. What, uh, what does that mean? Well, now you know that you are behind, so you can adjust. And this was the point I was trying to make about whether it's a five-year plan, whether it's a 10-year plan, whatever increments you are taking um, to go through, it does allow you to adjust mid-journey um, to hopefully help you achieve your goals. So once again, when we went back to that formula, and the different levers that you have to play with in that formula that will determine how much money you'll have in the future, you've got a couple choices. You can, of course, delay your retirement. So the more time you have to save and invest will, of course, mean that you will have more money in the future. So you could delay your retirement by 14 months. And all of this you can work out on that calculator. Required rate of return. So if you don't do anything, you're still saving the same amount of money. You haven't saved, changed your goal. You haven't changed um, when you're going to retire. You just need to earn a higher rate of return. So instead of 8.6, now you need to earn 9.6% a year for that last 10 years, um, which obviously is more challenging. The other thing you can do is you can save more money. So instead of saving $7,000 a year, you can save $22,000 a year, close to $23,000 a year. Or you can change your goal. You can say, okay, I want to adjust my goal for retirement. I don't want to save more. I don't want to delay my retirement. I don't think that I can actually get a higher return, um, so I can reduce that retirement goal by $350,000. So obviously, this is an example where you have not looked at this for 10 years. In reality, what we would encourage you to do is look at this more often um, so that you can make these adjustments. You can see some of these adjustments are huge, right? From a savings rate perspective, I don't think there's anybody um, or very few people out there that could go from saving $7,000 a year to $23,000 a year. Um, but uh, what you can do is if 
you do this more frequently, you can course correct. Now, obviously you don't wanna do this too frequently, but if you're doing this maybe every six months, taking a peek at where you are, um, or even quarterly, I think that that's fine. Um, and that allows you to course correct while you are actually marching towards that goal. All right, so I am going to go through a couple questions now, and then we can get back into the slides. Um, so let's see. So if you have any, uh, if you have any questions, please, uh, please send them through. So I'll go, it's confusing me. We have a lot going on in the chat and then a lot going on in, uh, in the questions as well. All right, one thing I did wanna show is I do want to show where you can find this on the website. So we did have a couple of questions about that. So what I've done is I've gone on to Morningstar Premium. I've gone on to Track Investments. And what we have here is goal setting. So I'll quickly show you this. So this is where you can set goals. So I've set a couple, which I'll go back to in a second. But basically, this is that calculator. And literally, this thing will change real time um, depending upon what you're trying to achieve. I will put in some... Just make up an example. Um, so inflation, so what inflation is gonna do is inflate that future value. All right, so if this was your goal and you usually get 28.4% a year, you better be pretty good at investing. Um, but of course, then you can save money every year. So what this allows you to do is on the fly set this goal and you can save that goal. Um, so if I click next, you can save it, you can name it, you can link it to a portfolio. I just want to show you one example of what we mean by tracking it. So I've obviously set up some goals before. If I go on to view goal, you can see I set a goal um, that required a 9.81% required rate of return. We've got a starting value, we've got a future value, didn't include inflation in this. Um, as you can see, and no additional investment, and I have a time horizon. So what this will do is it will automatically recalculate as time passes what that updated required rate of return is. So based on the updated goal, it's 9.11% when it was 9.81%. So this is an example of um, actually getting closer to your goal and just recalculating this based on two things. Number one, your portfolio value, because this is linked to a specific portfolio. This portfolio you can see is performing better than what that required rate of return is. So 10.63% when I needed 9.81%. So what that's done is that's dropped that required rate of return. So in this case, you are doing well. Um, you are ahead of the game in terms of, uh, in terms of achieving your goal. So this is kind of the lens that we want people to use when they are um, looking at their portfolio and tracking progress about, uh, um, against where they want to come or where they, where they want to get. And the reason we want you to do this is because this will actually inform you um, about what you should do. So if your required rate of return is rising, what does that mean? It does not mean you should sell all your investments and move into cash. And when required rate of returns go up, it often happens when markets fall and your portfolio balance is going down. And obviously what you don't wanna do is you don't wanna sell all of your growth assets and move into defensive assets when the market is done badly because you're selling at low valuation levels. So what this does is it provides a bit of behavioral coaching to remind you, okay, I need to take on risk in order to achieve that goal. Thank you guys very much. Um, I do appreciate it. So have any questions, um, send them to my email and yeah, thank you guys for joining. Hope everyone has a great night. Any advice in this video is general advice prepared by Morningstar without reference to your financial objectives, situation or needs. You should consider the advice in light of these matters and any relevant product disclosure statement before making any decision to invest.